hello and welcome to the car care Not channel folks today we have a 2022 hyundai ionic 5 a very interesting car from hyundai not because it's an electric car but i mean just look at it it looks like an 80s cartoon car doesn't it well in today's video we're going to take a look at the ionic 5 we're going to talk about some of its technical specifications we're going to talk about the outside the inside and everything in between so you can make a decision should you buy a Hyundai Ioniq 5 or should you look at other electric cars? Because the electric car market is kind of booming at the moment. Everybody is trying to join Tesla's bandwagon. Let's get right into it. Let's do a technical review of the Hyundai Ionic 5 and it's a very chilling moment for me as a mechanic opening a hood of a car and finding a place to uh, keep your sandwiches toasty. This doesn't have a full frunk as people like to call it. This has a small storage area because actually there's a lot of real estate going on in the front. Underneath the sandwich warmer right here, as I'd like to call it, because by the way, this will be very hot because there's a lot going on here. Underneath it, you'll find an electric motor and next to it, there will be a front inverter. Components that get very hot. There is a lot of technology in the Ionic 5 and things are very, very complicated. People are extremely happy that we finally have electric cars, that we can get rid of the internal combustion engine and its problems and emissions and oil changes and transmission fluid changes, spark plugs and all that mess. But guess what? Things are probably a hundred times more complicated here. Let's talk about some key highlight features of the Ionic 5 and you'll see what I mean. The Hyundai Ionic 5 uses possibly the world's most complicated HVAC system, it uses a heat pump system. Now, this is not something unique to this car. Many, many manufacturers, actually homes, use heat pump systems. But where this takes it to the next level is the integration between the HVAC system and the cooling systems, because there's actually two of them. Let me walk you through some basic highlights of this system just to give you an idea of how complicated this is. I'm gonna try to keep things simple because they're actually extremely, extremely complicated. So the Hyundai Ionic 5 has two cooling systems. One for the front motor, if you have an all-wheel drive model, and the front inverter, which does all the magic of converting electricity for that motor from the battery. And then you have a rear motor and a rear inverter. All Ionic 5 models will have a rear inverter, rear motor, because they're normally rear-wheel drive. If you have an all-wheel drive model, you have both. Now, there's a dedicated system to cooling these four components or two components. And then there's a completely separate cooling system for the battery. Now, how the HVAC system and the cooling systems integrate is the weakest point of the heat pump. See, heat pump systems, they basically take a normal car's HVAC system and they flip it. Instead of having the hot air being pushed outside and the cold air inside, it flips. You have the cold air being pushed outside and the hot air inside, basically flipping everything. It's a lot more complicated in reality than what I'm making it to sound to be, but let's just talk about basics here. But the problem with the heat pump is there comes a point where the outside is way too cold and that cold air that you're trying to extract outside through the condenser is just not going to work. So normally you'll find heat pump systems in the likes of the RAV4 Prime, a plug-in hybrid, where you have an option of turning on the engine and now you have kind of a heat generator. But in this, you don't have that available. So here's what they had to do. They had to utilize another heat generator, which is the battery, which is the motors. Now they don't generate as much heat as an internal combustion engine that has combustion, kind of like your uh, wooden stove. They don't have that here. So they needed to integrate the two. 
So in a normal car, in your gas guzzling giant car with spark plugs and oil changes and all that, you have a condenser in the front, you have a radiator in the front, that condenser's for the HVAC system, life is great. The Ioniq 5 also has a condenser in the front and life is wonderful, except it has two condensers. It has the regular old school condenser that sits in the front and then it has a liquid to liquid condenser or a liquid cooled condenser so that condenser is actually not used to really cool down the refrigerant it's actually used to take some of the heat from both cooling systems for the battery and for the motors to take heat into the HVA system when you are using the heat pump system in heating mode in extreme temperatures. Now, this sounds like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Except when you actually look at how everything is wired together. There's just so much going on here. I mean, the, the overcomplication is unbelievable. And let's get to a th something here. If you look at the two coolants for the two systems, usually you will have the same type of coolant for both systems. Well, the Ionic 5 has two different cooling systems with two different coolant in them. One of them is blue, one of them is pink. Potentially just the color change, because I don't see why there need to be a difference, but potentially just the color so you can distinguish between the two, which if that's the case, Great, because this helps servicemen like myself kind of distinguish what's leaking from where. So those who assume that electric cars, they're very simple. They just have the battery, they have a motor, that's it. There's nothing else. That is not the case, because in order to turn this into an electric car, there are so many benefits to the internal combustion engine that had to be compensated for in one way, shape, or form. And those one way, shape, or form are more complication. This has an electric compressor, for example. Nothing really bad about that. That's actually a very good idea, but there is two water pumps and there's a million gazillion valves that change the direction of the coolant and change the direction of the refrigerant and a battery chiller. And the, the, the complication goes on and on and almost makes that sweet internal combustion engine sound not so bad. But this is the future. I am not against technology. This is beautiful technology. This is engineering at its finest when they find solutions for problems without kind of canceling the whole project. This works and that's the most important thing. And of course, conveniently, you have the blue coolant and you have the pink coolant right next to the washer fluid. So in case you are in a hurry, you can add the washer fluid here and uh, ignore the rest. Very great idea. And then something else that is interesting. If you own a Tesla, they like to hide their batteries in a place you'll never find. Well, the 12 volt battery is right here. Super simple to get to. Takes you five minutes to jumpstart this car, should the battery ever dies, and life is wonderful. take a look underneath the Ionic 5 where things are extremely interesting here. First you have some covers, not engine covers, not transmission covers because we don't have none of those unnecessary stuff in an electric car. But over here is you actually have a subframe that goes across, you have components on top of it. But uh, before we move on to the very interesting stuff in the back, let's look at the suspension real quick here and the brakes. You have regular hydraulic brakes, which are just there for decoration. They actually hardly do anything unless you really stomp on the brakes. You have a control arm, lower control arm. This is a McPherson design. I like that the ball joint separates from the control arm. This is pretty cool design. You have actually cute looking axles for a car that has zero to 100% torque instantly. This is actually, it doesn't look like an enormous axle. I and mean, the way this thing accelerates, I fear these axles one day will just snap in half if you really push the envelope. But then as we move further back from that, we arrive at the enormous, enormous battery. Folks, this extends the width of the car and from this point all the way to here. This 
is a high voltage battery. And for those that are happy that internal combustion engines are going away, we don't have transmissions anymore and oil changes and all that, when this goes, it'll make up for all that. So sorry to break it to you, but these things are extremely expensive, extremely difficult to work on because you have this enormous thing that you need to bring down as one unit very, very cumbersome. And there's actually two service points on this particular one. There's one here. These are the main disconnects. And then there's another one, which is the bigger one in the back. These are actually the service kind of ports, if you would, because there's really nowhere else to disconnect things from this behemoth when if you need to bring it down for service. So there's usually some access points. And this one has two, one in the front, one in the back. But otherwise, you have these enormous brackets that are actually aluminum and all these bolts that hold the battery to the body. I mean, this is just a magnificent piece. Just look at it, it's, the, it's as big as a car. And this, and this it being so heavy and so low to the ground, actually helps electric cars become better handling because majority of your weight is at the very, very low in the body of the car. Then we move to the back where we have more covers. And behind this cover, you can really barely see it through here with the cover on, but this is where your rear motor is. It's covered up because it doesn't really need to be exposed to the elements, but this is where your rear motor is. We arrive at the suspension. It's kind of simplistic-ish suspension. Looks like it has a lot going on, but it's actually not. You have an arm at the bottom with the spring sitting on it, with the shock sitting on it, and there it connects to the knuckle. Very simple. Something that is very odd is the axle. If you look at the axle here, it almost looks like it has nothing in it. Look, look at this axle right here. Kind of an odd looking axle. It's actually, the, the rear usually is a lot smaller than the front, but this one, because this is actually a rear wheel drive car with an all wheel drive added to it to the, in the front. So it is a decent size for the rear. Still, I have my concerns. You keep pushing this, pushing this on hard accelerations. These things will snap. Pretty interesting design here. Something that is Goodbye to the yesteryears of internal combustion engines. You notice there is no exhaust. There is no, a lot of stuff doesn't exist here. There's no drive shaft going front to back. There's nothing. You just have this enormous battery. Folks, this is how electric cars, this is how the future looks like. Just flat belly. All gasoline cars are trying to make their belly flat so they would have good aerodynamics and all that. Here, that comes standard because of this enormous battery. Let's talk about the exterior of the Ionic 5. And the first thing you see when you look at this thing is it looks like, the best way to describe it is an 80s cartoon car, Tron. This is the kind of uh, image that pops in my head when I see this. I mean, you look at the front. First, it's all closed up, except this. We'll talk about this in a second. But it's all closed up, and you have this... Everything is blocky. There's no really curves. The bumper comes here and just makes a sharp turn and then another sharp turn and it just goes back. This is a design that was very common in old cars. And here we are in 2022 back with this. The headlight is just, just this giant block and the, like the design of the light, everything is like blocky and pixelated. It almost looks like a Minecraft car. Pretty interesting design, very bold one. This is a kind of design that when concept cars come out, you think, okay, this looks great in the auto show, but then the actual car comes out, it looks nothing like the prototype. But this looks like a prototype, but it isn't, which is pretty interesting. Something else that is very interesting, all over here, this all lights up at night and it just makes it kind of like a symphony of light. There's lights everywhere in the front. And something else that is interesting, this opening right here, right now it is open. 
This is actually a flap that opens and closes as the cooling needs of this car, which we, just like we talked about in the technical review, there's a lot going on with the cooling system here. So these flaps open and close on demand. Right now they're open, you see them open. And I'll put a picture right here when they're actually closed. Over here, we have a little charge indicator when you plug in the car. This actually lights up so you from far away, you can see where is the charge indicator at. We got a little uh, camera right here. And then as we make our way around, there's something interesting about the side. Actually, there's a lot of interesting things about this car, so let's start. This is kind of reminds me of the Toyota Supra, the current generation Toyota Supra. The fender is tiny. It's a little bit bigger than the Supra. This is the fender just here. And the rest is just hood. You have this giant line right here. I mean, very blocky design. Total Minecraft design is the way I'm gonna call it in this video. Another thing that is interesting, when you come to the fender right here, you have these like cuts. It almost looks like they continued the design of the wheel in the fender arch right here. And speaking of the wheel, it uh, reminds me of a 1980s, like third generation Toyota Supra. This is a saw blade wheel. Very, very bold design and very brave one because in 2022, this is completely out of character. This is totally 80s. And this enormous saw blade is a 20 inch wheel. It's not even like a 15 inch wheel. This is a 20 inch wheel. If they would have put 15 inch wheels here, it would have made it totally an 80s character. But as we walk through the side, there's this line in the door, and then there's this other curve in the door, and there's these lines, and it's just too much going on. Which leads us to the biggest thing that's going on in each door is this uh, handle that sticks out. As soon as you approach the car, they pop out, and you can actually push this and, and kind of open it, but they pop out, and behind it, there's actually a, there's a place for a physical key, so you can actually Look, if you look right here, you can actually unlock the door in case your battery is dead or something. That's uh, actually nice of them to do that. But something about all cars that have handles like this, I know they do it for aerodynamics, but I don't know how much a handle will do for aerodynamic when you have this enormous mirror right next to it. I guess they have to put mirrors, but they don't have to put handles. That's I don't like these because they're very confusing and this is just one more thing that's gonna break that's unnecessary. Could I would have sacrificed a couple of miles of range for regular door handles that are not gonna break. But as we make our way in the back, you have the same thing in the rear wheel arch, these kind of cuts and lines and pretty interesting. And then we have another compliance flap. If you're not familiar with the compliance flap, in the US there is a law that the wheel can only stink out of the car this much. So when they put different wheels on cars, they stick out, now they're not in compliance. So we have to put this little flap to keep it in compliance. This is hence the name, the compliance uh, flap. This one has one as well. Then we move in the back, and uh, the back is also 80s, extremely 80s. I mean, we have lights with louvers on them, they don't really do much, all the lighting is here, but we have lights with louvers on them. Then we have this giant bar all across, very blocky, no curves really, it's just a giant block. However, the brake lights are only here and here, and then there is one tiny strip at the bottom, then another brake light here and here, and that's also the turn signal. Don't know what's the deal with the uh, very retro look there, but that's that. This one is all-wheel drive, so you see the H-Track right here. There's no mufflers, of course. This is electric. Pretty interesting design overall. The only thing that's normal is this massive wing right here that is open right here. Pretty cool setup here. This actually looks normal. It doesn't, almost doesn't follow the theme of the car with everything being blocky, but there's a giant wing here that actually has two openings. And on the roof, we have, of course, a shark fin. 
totally does not match the theme of this car. I wish they would have redesigned the shark fin to make it like a, a block with another block on top of it. It would have been funny, but they didn't do that. Here is the charging port, which of course is electric. So something about this door, I have to say, when you go look at a car like a RAV4 Prime, I know that's not electric, but it also has a charging door. It's very flimsy. This one, not really very flimsy, and that is a good thing. You have to press this. I wish this was like a, basically you're, what you're trying to do here, you're trying to press this button through the outside. You see this little tab right here? You're trying to press this button. Not the coolest design, but hey, that's what they went with. Here's the charging port, and here is the, uh, I guess when you go to a bigger charger, that's what you need. So that one is covered because the charger that comes with the car only needs the top one. Pretty cool design, very brave exterior. You know what? I'll give it to them. This will not be for everybody, but it's a pretty cool design that gets a lot of attention because it looks like a cartoon, it looks like a Batmobile going down the street, but just Batmobile from the 80s, perhaps. Pretty cool design. And of course, in a world, electric car world that is dominated by Tesla, everybody's trying to be cool like Tesla, right? So on the remote, which is, this is a very busy remote, you have lock, unlock, open the door for the charging, this is the panic, and this opens the back trunk. This is a remote start, which is cool, but this one is pretty cool. So this is supposed to get you out of your parking spot. If two giant Jeeps, you always see this on TikTok and YouTube shorts and whatnot, two giant Jeeps parked very close to you and you can't really get in your car. Well, you lock your car, you start it, Car is running, you don't wait for the engine to start, this is electric. And then you press one of the buttons. And the car goes backwards. As soon as you let go, it stops. And then you press the other button, in case you're parked the other way around. The car goes forward. Very cool to see it in person. And of course, you hear the UFO sound. Very similar to that, Toyota does the same sound, pretty much everybody. This is basically a noise to tell you that the car is running, because electric cars are so quiet. This is like some kind of, of a notification that, hey, the car is in motion. So you have that UFO sound. Don't know why they couldn't just emulate an engine running sound, but they went with that sound. Then we talk about the inside of the Ionic 5. And here there is a theme, small car, big space. And they really did that extremely well. See, because this is an electric car, you don't have a transmission hub. Everything is flat here. There is no hump because there's no exhaust, nothing really running to the back, no drive shaft, nothing. So space is something that they did very well here. Let's talk about it. First, you have this floating center console. There's really nothing here. There's a little storage cubby here and uh, nothing in between. This is super cool because you can really store stuff here. But then you have some um, things to leave some certain circular items. I don't say cup holders in my channel. And then underneath this floating center console, which actually does fold up, you have a lot of storage here. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you see in a minivan. Minivans are so tall and they have all the space here. But yet, here's a small hatchback that has this. Folks, getting in this car is so spacious, the visibility is great because they went with this almost, I want to call it simplistic theme. Pretty cool design. I love it. It looks super cool. And then also in the interior, you have these enormous two screens. I am not very fond of screens because for the most part, they are unnecessary complication in most cases. Now, the thing with this car, which is an absolute unnecessary complication, 
you have this giant screen here, which has all your gauges, which really doesn't have any gauges because there's no, no temperature gauge. There's really nothing else, just your charge mode and whatnot. What, what mode you're driving in your speed, how much you're generating. But all of this could have been done with a tiny screen. There's really not much customizations else here. And that's what I don't like about this because it can be confusing at times. And then we move on to the radio, which for the most part can be simple to operate, but it's not as responsive as you would say in a car of this, you know, magnitude of technology. It's just not that good. And the worst thing is it's not exclusive to this car. I mean, you look in the radio, start going through the menus. It's really shared with a lot of models, just bigger screen perhaps and uh, different configuration. But there's not really much going on, but there's small annoying things about it. For example, you want to put the HVAC on. Okay, you put in auto. Well, it's not that simple. There's auto one, there's auto two, and then there's auto three. There's three settings for auto. That sounds pretty cool. You can have the fan on high or lower, but then there is climate. You press it, it takes you to the climate menu. And then there is warmer which takes you to the seat controls. Now, the cool thing is when you go to warmer, it's actually the seat cooling and warming. So this is not the best configuration for this. But then we move next to it, you have the mode. This is like some touch capacitive thing, which not the best. I wish this, these were physical buttons, just like these. These are so high quality and nice, but that's fine. But then we go into the top where we have map, navigation, media, favorite, tune. I don't know how many people in this very technological car will need the tune part, especially when you have them on the steering wheel and uh, you have a touch screen, but I would have much rather this would be your seat controls, like the heated seats and whatnot. You have a parking camera, which is actually very decent quality, not the highest that you find in some high-end cars, but it is decent quality 360 camera. Right now it's skewed because we have the door open, but it is it is nice. You have parking sensors. I could never understand why cars have a parking sensor when they have a 360 camera, but hey, that's what Hyundai went with. And there's something Hyundai did that is pretty cool. So when you plug this car into charge with the promised 18 minute charge, talk about that in a minute, you can put your driver's seat in zero gravity mode. When you press it, you're going to get a message that says, please make sure there's enough seat in the rear, enough space in the rear seat. So there is enough space. So. Hey, I can do this. This is a zero gravity chair. It's not really the best zero gravity chair, but hey, something is better than nothing. Let's put it that way. Then when you're done charging, after your mere 18 minutes, you just put it back and it goes worse back to its original position. This is pretty cool because, let's talk about the 18 minute charge time. Some people will say that sounds too good to be true. Here's my real world testing. I have only one charging station that can do this in my area. I actually live in a suburb of Chicago, so it's not, you know, the middle of nowhere where there's no charging stations. There's only one charging station that can do this. The car was at 26% charge. I went to the charging station. It took 15 minutes to charge to 80%, which is where they recommend you charge it to if you want long, long life of the battery. And then it took 39 minutes from 26% to 100%, and it cost me just over $22. Not bad, and usually it, I just wanted to see how much, how long it takes to 100%, but normally 15 minutes to charge it from 20 something to 80%, or as they advertise from 10% to 80% in 18 minutes, I see that happening, and that is pretty cool. Something else that is interesting about this interior is the uh, existence of floppy pedal shifters. But in here, they don't really change gears because there's no gears. They actually change the intensity of your region braking. And if you press, once you get to level three, you press it, it goes into one pedal driving mode. 
very cool, works really good, does take a little bit of time to get used to, but once you get used to it, it actually works really good. Something else that is pretty interesting about the steering wheel. Now, the buttons here, they're kind of you think there's no buttons but actually the surround of the of the steering wheel is a button so i guess there is that but something interesting is usually this is where the manufacturer would very proudly display their company name and be very proud of their new child that they just made and all that but here we have not one not two not three four dots I don't know, Hyundai was embarrassed to put their name here or they just ran out of money for this car, but there is four dots. There's no Hyundai on the steering wheel. And then we have the glass roof. It's not really a sunroof because it doesn't really open. It's just a glass roof, it's just a giant piece of glass. Very cool, very, we are copying Tesla cool, but this is how it closes. So it's a two piece shade that comes from both sides and it closes and you can see the line in between them and then it just opens. There's really no more adjustability to it or anything else that opens, that's really it. There's one more cool touch about the lighting in the interior. Now the color of the lighting is this cool white. Of course, this is a modern car, you're gonna have the modern cool lights. But something that is cool, your map lights, there's no button for them, you just actually press them. That is, Pretty cool and pretty luxurious. I like that, this is actually pretty cool. But then right next to that you have some dead buttons, empty buttons, unused buttons, just to remind you, you know, there's more options you didn't get, you cheaped out. Although this is pretty well optioned, I don't know what else would go here, but there's two empty buttons. And something else that is actually super cool and I really like it. So when you turn your turn signal, on the screen, it shows you your blind spot, not just a light on the mirror, it actually shows you a live video of your blind spot. This is super cool and super useful. I actually use it in parking more than I do in seeing your blind spot because if we really think about it, I mean, you have a warning on the mirror, you are gonna see that warning. You're not really gonna need to see your blind spot per se, but it is still cool for parking. I wish every time you put it in reverse, that happens on both sides, so you can really see the edges of the car. I am sitting in the back seat. I am 5'7", this is my driving position. Plenty of lug room. Folks, I told you this car was very well designed. This interior it has a lot of space, and the lack of the transmission hub makes, means the, tra the passenger sits in the middle in this three seat configuration. It's not gonna have to be all cramped up because of the hump. It's flat here very very nice and in addition to that i mean after all yes you, this price this car is pricey you look at a small stuff in the back seat there's an ac vent here usually this is reserved for pretty high-end cars this is really cool to see another thing is you have a manual shade for the kiddo so the sun wouldn't hit them in the eye nice touches to kind of start to justify this high price from hyundai Now, it is not all rainbows and butterflies with the Ionic 5. Let's talk about some things I don't actually like about the Ionic 5, starting with the whole thing, the electric part. So people always rush into buying an electric car. I am done with oil changes. I am done with the internal combustion engine that has driven me from the hospital when I was born, that has basically gotten me through my whole life up to this point. I am done with it. I want an electric car. Usually people buy it because they're cool, but later on secretly they discover that there are so many downsides to an electric car that they never thought about. And the Ionic 5 joins that club. Just this will be any electric car. Life cannot be quick paced in an electric car because you're charging time. And yes, 15, 18 minutes, whatever, but you can't charge it at your home for 18 minutes. That's just not gonna happen. You have to charge it for hours and hours, even if you get a level two charger, still hours and hours. You can't just, if life gets ahead of you and you're kind of in a crunch, you can't just plug it in for an hour and let's go across the country. That's not gonna happen. You're gonna start to plan your life according to the car's charging level, not really according to how your hectic life is going. 
you gotta adjust a lot and people usually don't think about that and they start limiting and then before they know it they're renting a car to go on that long trip because they don't want to deal with the range and anxiety speaking of range and anxiety i had range anxiety in this car i've had this for a week now it's going back tomorrow but i have range anxiety because i plugged it in my 110 charger at home just to, to the wall that the cable that came with it and I was surprised that the cable was not even open I'm like hmm this car has some miles and then I discovered why I left it to charge overnight it barely went up one percent sure you can buy a level two charger absolutely but still you're not the same as the big charger and in my town and it's not that remote area in the middle of nowhere or there's electric cars everywhere there's only one real charger in my area so I had to go there, leave the car, come back, and, and now it just became a hassle. So think about this before you buy an electric car, please. And then we go inside the Ionic 5. Let's talk about things I don't like, specifically to this model. The big screens. I mean, you have these giant screens, but there's really nothing proprietary about them. They're good. They are a little bit laggy on the response, especially the gauge in front of you it, there's really not a lot of customizations i mean i would have rather have this car at a lower price point without the screen gauge because after all this is not some hyper car that is super exciting this is an everyday car and the prices are kind of going up you're you're not really going to find a lot of value yes the screen when you turn the turn signal that shows you the blind spot is cool but i can live without it for a lower price point for this car and then continuing on that kind of mismatch technology theme there's no wireless apple carplay and android auto absolutely makes no sense in a car like this this is all techy and cool and technology and the latest and greatest and then here's a giant hungering wire to connect to your apple carplay makes no sense at all and then possibly the worst thing about the ionic 5 something that i absolutely dislike from the first second i drove it the shifter the shifter is a button which is fine it's like one of those rotary thingies but it's backwards and their idea i understand what they were trying to do with it so you flip it up it's into drive to go forward you flip it down you're backing up but that's not how transmissions has been in cars forever you go reverse up drive down this has caused me to almost crash this car so many times in my garage because i would put it in reverse and it's actually in drive or vice versa it is horrendous I, this is the perfect car to have three buttons on the dash There's one is drive neutral reverse and then maybe another button that says park somewhere else and that's it i don't know what's the deal with this i really don't like it it really this the whole stock this giant stock that doesn't do anything just the end of it turns and then you have park on the side makes absolutely no sense and be careful if you drive one of these because you're gonna put it in the wrong gear eventually so should you buy hyundai ionic 5 let's talk about that a little bit because this car overall even with its flaws it is a cool car it's kind of interesting but it's not for everybody see they're trying to make a mass electric car i don't know about my 80 year old neighbor buying one a car that looks like this it's just this is the theme with all electric cars, almost all of them actually. They all look weird. They all have these crazy features and kind of crazy looks. They don't need to be though. If you want to car manufacturers, in case you're watching, I don't think you are because you never listen. If you are watching, just take an Elantra, take whatever model you have Hyundai and just pluck out the engine and put motors and let's do this because that's what people want. People want normal cars that they have associate with. They function the same. They look the same. They just don't have an engine. They have a giant battery instead. And this is the furthest, possibly one of the most extreme electric cars out there. I mean, look at the thing everywhere interior is very functional but the outside is just too much for most people folks this otherwise other than the crazy looks is a pretty competent car they did a lot of good things here the inside is very functional very spacious very nice driving it around town it is 
decently quiet, mainly because there's no engine, but the cabin kind of insulation is decent. But take it on the highway and it's Hyundai as usual, business as usual, very loud. Seats are decently comfortable. Again, this is not some big high-end car. I know the price is pretty high. This one, as we're testing here, is 56,000, but they're okay. They're not the most comfortable seats in the world, but they're not uncomfortable per se. If you're kind of not into the whole Tesla cult thing, this, in my opinion, is built better than Tesla's. Tesla has great technology, but they have horrible execution. And Tesla crowd, sorry, the, the truth hurts, but that's the truth. This is built like a real car. Gaps match, things are put together well. I don't see glued panels. I don't see signs of things that are done last minute. It seems like all of them are mass produced. They have their issues. They're gonna have their issues. Of course, nothing is perfect, but it's made well enough. And to top that off, we have Hyundai's ridiculously long warranty. So how bad can it be, right? I like how everything is put together here. It seems like this is not one of those glued together cars from Hyundai. They kind of did well on this one. Fit finish is very good. It's not a wow you after five minutes, you start seeing the gaps of things rattling. No, it is nice. But the one thing I will say about this car that is surprising even though the striking look and this cool interior, all that stuff, after driving it for two days, it just becomes like any other car. You kind of start losing the interest in all the stuff that it has. And that is very important because every car buyer will run into this. But to me, driving it, I like that it's quiet. I like that it's the interior is spacious, it is functional, and that is usually what stays with the car buyer. Past the first one, two, three, up to a month of excitement of a new car, that's what stays with you. This can be a good family hauler because it's decently sized, decently equipped, a little pricey for the size, but overall a good car if you can live with these quirky looks. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.